where they relate to, and where certain aspects of their lives take place. Home is a place where you reconnect with people or memories. In some Aboriginal cultures in Australia, Australia notes, which are also the most enduring, home is a place you care for, and as you would if it were your family. Madeline Ostrander is a science journalist whose reporting focuses on climate, energy, environmental justice, and humans' ongoing struggle to find an appropriate place on the planet. Her writings appeared in the NewYorker.com, The Nation, Sierra Magazine, Audubon Magazine, Slate, PBS Nova, and many other publications. She has received support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the Artist Trust, USC Annenberg Center for Health, and, for Health Journalism, and the Fund for Investigative Journalism, among many other places. Please join me in welcoming Madeline Ostrander. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, it just occurred to me that I made out of silence my own phone. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been hearing from a number of inspiring people working through our book in Pacific Northwest on climate change. Um, and so what I wanted to talk to you about today is about this book that I spent more than 10 years working on. And I know that some of you have had a chance to read it. And so some of you are familiar with some of these stories, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, and what I wanted to offer is both where the book came from and also what a community, like this community, might be able to take away from some of those stories. So um, I started out, um, my first work as a journalist was for Yes Magazine, and some of you might know Yes, it's based on Bainbridge Island. Um, in 2008, I took a job as an editor at Yes Magazine, which, so that had all of its offices on Bainbridge Island. Um, and it was kind of an interesting moment in our country's consciousness about what climate change meant. Um, first, uh, I'll tell you a story, which is that the, the first, this is the first issue that I worked on at Yes Magazine. And when I walked into the office, um, the editors were um, busy kind of putting the previous issue to bed. And so my boss turned to me and she said, I think, I think I'd like you to help us get started on this. And here's some preliminary notes on it. And her first title for the issue was A Plan to Save the World. So like my first assignment was to try to think about how to save the world, which um, I'm afraid we, um, we didn't quite yet, um, and it was just a little bit daunting, but um, it was also a, a, an interesting moment um, in climate change. Um, Al Gore's movie Inconvenient Truth came out in 2006, Hurricane Katrina was in 2005, and we all saw the shocking images of what that hurricane did to New Orleans and how unfair and, and tragic some of those impacts were. And so I think there was both a certain sense of momentum on climate change, that you know, we needed to do something and also a sense of what it could look like. But it also still felt pretty abstract. Um, one of the examples that Bill McKibben pointed to in, in that issue that I just showed you was about Greenland melting. This is a tour group taking a tour looking at um, ice sheets, you know, calving. Um, and of course, what happens in, in the Arctic and what happens with ice does have a huge influence on the planet. But when we're trying to talk about what is, what is climate change, what does it mean? Why should we care about it? Ice seems very far away, I think, to people in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, we do have glaciers, but not quite like this. Um, and I think even a lot of the solutions that were talked about then, um, and, and really a lot of the solutions that have been talked about up until now, were kind of big, far away, big picture solutions. You know, we wanted the federal government to, to pass cap and trade, which unfortunately didn't happen at the time. Um, you know, we wanted international negotiations to take big steps, and some of that has happened, but maybe not as ambitiously as we wanted to. But I don't, I think people have often not had a sense of what do I do in my own life? What do I do in my community? Um, and so in those 15 years, um, I think climate change has started to look to people more like this. Um, this is a picture that I took from the window of the Kaiser Medical Building in Capitol Hill in Seattle. In 2018, I remember going in and they were giving out masks to kids because the air quality was so bad, and of course, 
this is not nearly as bad as what we experienced in 2020 during Labor Day week when there were all those fires up and down the West Coast. Um, this is a shot from um, an image from the Seattle Times of the number of 90 degree days over the last you know, few decades. And you can see it going up and up. 2023 was actually a record. I believe there were 13 over 90 degree days. Um, so you know, we're feeling, we're literally feeling the heat. This is something called a color scale. Um, it's also sometimes called warning stripes, and you can actually go online and get like a t-shirt or a dress or socks. Um, but you can also look it up, look up the warming stripes for your particular area or region. And so I pulled them up for Washington. Red ears are hotter than average, and blue ears are cooler than average. And you can see, you can see pretty dramatically that we're getting wetter. I'm sorry, redder and redder. Um, and and this um, this story hit me pretty hard, and you guys probably remember it as well. Um, in 2021, when we had the Pacific Northwest heat dome, when we had all those 100 degree temperatures, there was a wave of shellfish die-offs on the beach because they just weren't adapted to that. Um, and it, it was really troubling. Um, so I, um, you know, early on when I was working at I tried to look for stories to, to talk to people about how we were going to be experiencing these local impacts. And what I found was something else, which is also that um, a lot of the solutions, a lot of the really good ideas can also happen on a local level. A, a lot of what we can do can happen in community. This is a picture of Dory Robinson on the left. Those of you who have read the book um, mm -hmm. are familiar with her story. Uh, Doria lives in um, Richmond, California, just a couple miles from this refinery on the right. This is the Chevron oil refinery. It's one of the largest greenhouse gas emitters on the west coast and uh, one of the largest oil refineries on the west coast. Doria lived in Richmond. Richmond went through a lot of housing discrimination, a lot of economic difficulties. Um, she left the city for a while and then she came back feeling like she wanted to try to create something good there. And so she started planting gardens. And that might sound a little quixotic, but it actually turned out that 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 was part of a whole set of solutions and ideas that came out of people investing in community. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but th that's where I started with this book. I started with finding stories in communities where people were doing something positive. Um, this is a, just a sort of point of clarification. Um, there, people talk about doing action on climate change in two ways. There's climate adaptation, which is taking action to adjust to the current impacts climate change and adapt to the ones that are supposed to come in the future. And then there's climate change mitigation, which is things that you might do to bring in emissions, so to, to limit how bad the global picture gets by cutting your own emissions or cutting an emission of a region. Um, and these are both really important, and I tend to blur them together because I think that we ha really have to start talking about them at once, not separately. So, um, for instance, um, I did some reporting up in Alaska, um, both for this book and for some other stories I did. I went up to the North Slope, and the North Slope is having this experience where the coastlines are, you know, just coming apart and, and eroding and collapsing. There's there's huge impacts from warming temperatures in the Arctic, but they're also incredibly dependent on oil, and um, that has put them in kind of a trapped situation. Um, of course, you all probably know that the Biden administration just approved a major oil project up there. So when you talk about adaptation without talking about mitigation, you know, that's a kind of trap. And if we talk about mitigation without talking about adaptation, you could get the sort of situation where you build a road that's, you know, or you build some kind of infrastructure like a, a railroad that isn't set to withstand heat or isn't set to withstand flooding. So you, you really have to talk about those things at once. Oops, I've got a um, so the first story I want to talk about is the story that the book opens with, and that's a story about wildfire. And one of the things, I think one of the lessons of that story is that while um, there are a lot of really troubling trends with wildfire on the West, 
um, and this is a this is a headline from the New York Times. Um, we're not just hapless in the face of things like wildfire. We're not just we're not just victims. We're not you know we're not just at the mercy of these things. And so I think that when we see them in the news, we often see these kinds of headlines. This season is part of a long-term trend toward more freaking, more devastating fires in the West that shows no sign of slowing down. That's not necessarily untrue, but it doesn't tell us a lot about what we can do. Um, so the book opens with the story of Okanagan Town in Washington, which of course went through the Carlton Complex wildfire, which was the largest still the largest single wildfire on record in Washington State. And then again, they went through the Okanagan Complex wildfires. And then in 2020, they went through the Pearl Hill and, and a series of other wildfires out there. So they, they had a lot of experience with very damaging fires. This is Carlene Anders. She is formerly the mayor of Pateras, Washington. She lost um, one of her family homes and her mom also lost their orchard, um, a lot of the buildings that were on the orchard, a lot of which were part of her retirement plan. And Carlene was a firefighter, uh, still is a firefighter. During the Carlton Complex, she found herself out in the valley fighting fire, and she had never experienced a wildfire that looked quite like that. She would spent many, many seasons fighting wildfires, and suddenly she looked around, there's a scene that I described in the book where she looked around and she thought, we're not going to be able to control this fire. Because it, you know, we, we've had a history of being able to control fires and suppress them. And we're getting to a point where we can't really do that anymore. Um, but she, she helped fight the fire. She helped keep it from you know, destroying the downtown of Pateros, although the, the town was still pretty bad hit. Um, and then when the fire you know, began to calm, she uh, took charge of the recovery effort. And she then became the leader of a huge effort that became countywide the following year, um, has become a model for communities trying to recover from wildfire, and um, has really become a model for communities trying to rebuild after disaster. Um, this is Carlene standing in front of a rebuilt well. The water supply was damaged during the, excuse me, the water supply was damaged during the Carlton Complex fire. And one, at one in front of them, one of the wells, they built a sort of stage and interpretive center so that people could remember what had happened during the fire and honor some of the things that they lost. But it was also a way of people remembering that they live in an area that's going to keep experiencing wildfires. So they need to prepare for that. They need to think about what that means. Um, another thing that Carlene reflected on in book was about the idea that she's worried that people are going to forget. She's worried that they're going to become complacent because fires are going to keep coming back. Um, this is a museum exhibit that uh, Carlene and her friends and neighbors put together. It was called Fire and Ice. Um, and so this was one of the photographs that was pinned on these sort of handmade um, displays that they put on the walls. This is the fire coming down that hill toward the terrace in 2014. This was some of the artifacts from after the fire. Um, you can see some melted glass, kind of funny, like candle wax shape, and um, old shovel and, and some warped metal. At the top left, if you can see it at all, it's, it's a burned out car. Um, the top right is actually a former mobile home, which you know, those are not really <coughs> built well to withstand the fires. Um, so, Carlene was still reeling from those losses, but she stepped forward to try to help the community recover. And one of the things they did was raise huge amounts of money to help people who had very few resources rebuild. And uh, this is a house that's on the Colville Reservation in central Washington. Um, this family's house was burned down in the Tunk Block fire. And um, they actually, most of the families rebuilt in the same place, but this one rebuilt in a new, a new spot. And one of the things you can see about it, so the roof is metal, and the siding is a particular kind of fire-resistant siding. So this house is a lot less likely to be hit by the next fire. And there's also a big space around the house so that, um, so that the vegetation fire won't spread from the vegetation of the house. And also so that um, 
you know, a fire truck can get in there and defend the house if needed. One of the things, um, one of the interesting things I found out as I was researching in this book, that there's a guy who's done experiments in Canada where he, he literally uh, took things out, like walls out in the wilderness and burned them down and tried to see how they burn. And one of the things he's found out is that a lot of the fires, including the, the Paradise, the campfire which destroyed Paradise, California, would not have needed to be so devastating if people just built their houses a little differently. Like the way fire spreads through community and becomes devastating has a lot to do with how people manage their houses and their yards. So there's a lot that a community like this can do to try to keep themselves safe. Um, this is Susan Pritchard. She's a forest ecologist based in the Natal. She also has a post at the University of Washington. Susan has been researching how forests recover from wildfire and what kinds of things make them more resilient against wildfire. Um, and one of the things, especially in eastern Washington, in areas where the ecosystems there are all adapted to fires, there's always been wildfires in the Pacific Northwest, especially on the east side of the mountains. Um, places that, that have had smaller fires, like what are called prescribed burns, so this was actually an indigenous practice originally to try to light low, controllable fires. Um, places that have had fire before are less likely to burn again. And so one of the things that Susan and a lot of her colleagues are trying to promote is the idea that, um, and, th and this is really a consensus across the world of, of fire ecology, that if we can do more prescribed burns, if we can allow more small fires to burn, we won't get as many of these big, devastating fires. And I think the bigger lesson there is that the way that we deal with climate change is to take care of and restore the ecosystems around us. And I think that's something that, that you know, folks here on Lonely Island are also trying to do. It, it holds true in a lot of cases with climate change. Um, and of course, you know, when I started this project, we were mostly um, thought, we mostly thought of wildfires as being in eastern Washington or a central Washington thing, but now we're getting more and more of them in the west, um, including the fires that we saw last fall around Index and um, around Goat Rocks. This was a fire that burned on the west side of North Cascades, and they did some studies of it to try to figure out, you know, what happens during a fire like this, how, do the, how does the vegetation respond, um, and what do they do? Um, so, you know, do they try to restore this forest? Um, what's the lesson here? It turns out that actually on the west side, and I know you guys heard a presentation about west side fires, and I should add that I'm not an expert on this subject, but the, the the North Cascade scientists that I've talked to say that one of the most important things is protecting old growth, because old growth holds onto moisture out here. So that's another case where our fate and the fate of the ecosystems around us are really connected. So another story I told in the book is about coasts and floods, and I think that's also really resonant with what we're dealing with out here. This is Jenny Wolf. She's a historic preservationist, and she's inspecting the roof here on a historic pumping station in St. Augustine, Florida, which is one of the most historic cities in the country. It was built by the Spanish in the 1500s, and it just has layers and layers and layers of history. It has civil rights history. It has this incredible architecture that was built, I mean, admittedly by someone who's kind of an oil baron, but it was built, it was built by Henry Flagler, um, gorgeous Spanish Renaissance architecture. And so St. Augustine is, is really a treasure and a fascinating place. Um, Jenny went through Hurricane Matthew in 2016. And St. Augustine was at the time trying to figure out what do we do about sea level rise. It was really hard to get people to talk about it. And then Hurricane Matthew came and everybody got a demonstration of what it looks like when water comes flooding into community. This was Jenny's house. Um, it's on a low-lying barrier island it's called Anastasia Island. And her whole apartment flooded really catastrophically during her in Matthew um, and it trashed her place. Um, but uh, she was also working at the time in St. Augustine as a historic preservationist. And so she, she really got to work and try to help figure out how the community can adapt to this kind of flooding. Um, there's, there's Matthew showing up in the street. Uh, it didn't actually overtop the seawall, but it went 
through the sponsors and so and came up through the into the streets that way. And so one of the lessons actually that St. Augustine has learned that is that they have to change their infrastructure. They have all of these old storm sewers. And they're just doing simple things like changing out valves so that you know that in subsequent storms water doesn't come up in that direction. Um, Jenny had to be responsible for approving a lot of <coughs> ways that people wanted to change their houses and, and try to make their houses more flood proof. Um, St. Augustine both wants to protect its sense of home, its sense of who are we in a flood, and you know, also let people figure out how to deal with floods. So a lot of the houses on the waterfront are being raised, like this one here. Um, and I think, um, you know, I could, I could tell you a lot about the city infrastructure and um, you know, what people are doing to deal with floods, but I think a larger lesson about about St. Augustine and about Jenny's story is that there's a lot of decisions to be made, there's a lot of trade-offs, there's things that we will lose, and there's things that we will be able to protect. I once interviewed uh, a sociologist who studied sea level rise, and she gave me this very powerful quote. She said, against the rising sea, we will not win in the long term. We will lose money, we will lose ecosystems, we will lose houses, so how do we deal with that loss? And that's one piece of it. But I think also there are things we can protect. And I think we need to make choices about what those things are. Um, so this is um, an image of the site of Fort Mose, which shows in the 18th century the first free black community in the United States um, under Spanish rule. And it's now an, eco uh, sorry, an archaeological site. And parts of it are already underwater. And researchers are doing a lot of work to try to document it as much as possible. And we have similar things out here, right? Um, here in Washington State, we also have around 500 archaeological sites that are risk from sea level rise. And so there's work being done here as well to try to document historic sites and try to protect those places and protect the information that's in them. Uh, this is the seawall next to the Castillo de San Marcos which is a fort that was built by the Spanish in the 17th century. Um, it's made of coquina, which is this stone that's endemic to this part of Florida, um, which is uh, made of ancient clamshells. It's probably the most iconic place in St. Augustine, and in the very long run, if St. Augustine starts to see more extreme sea level rise, it's not the sort of place you can pick up and move, right? It's a fort made of stone. Um, but in the, in the nearer term, um, there's a lot of work being done, uh, for instance, by students at the Naval Academy, which is actually based in Maryland, studying things like green infrastructure, studying things like how can you know, breakwaters be put in to keep storm surges from flooding into this place. Um, and so there's a lot of things that the community can do to try to protect a place like this. Um, also, interestingly, um, this site is more durable than a lot of some of the newer things. When, when Hurricane Matthew and Hurricane uh, Irma hit St. Augustine, what flooded on this site and what was the most damage was actually the National Park Service offices and not any of the historic parts of the site. Um, and this is another strategy that the city has been trying to take. Um, they actually picked this cottage up, moved it inland to a, an agricultural museum. Um, and converted the land that was on Key Park because the land is really flood prone and they didn't want anybody to build on it anymore. And they also put up a big berm to try to keep water from coming in in that particular spot. It was a low point in the community. Um, so as I said, I think, I think the lesson of St. Augustine is that there are a lot of choices that a community has to make. There's a lot of planning and a lot of decisions, but there are still things that a community can do in the face of sea level rise. Um, this is the village of Newtok, which is an indigenous Yupik community in the southwest of Alaska. Um, this is a picture that I took in the fall of 2019 of an eroding riverbank. And this is a house that you can see is far too close to that eroding riverbank. Um, the people of Newtok have been trying to organize a relocation for a couple of decades. And they now have about half of the community in a new site on the other side of the river that is much more stable. Um, they were labeled as America's first climate refugees, and the landscape around Newtok is really dynamic, very, very flood 
you know, prone to floods to some degree anyway, but what's happened because of climate change is that the ice that used to come in the winter and hold the landscape in place is not as reliable anymore. And the permafrost, which is supposed to be this sort of permanent frozen material that sits under much of the Alaskan landscape is actually starting to collapse and come apart. Um, so they're getting much more catastrophic erosion all the time. Um, this is Bernice John and her family. She's uh, currently, I think, an elder advisor to the community, but she and her husband are some of the people who really led the relocation process. And um, I went out with them to do some fish trapping. Um, they're still very connected to a lot of subsistence practices on the landscape. I think one of the lessons of New Talk to me is that I mean, they're facing this catastrophic situation that is really very heartbreaking for a lot of people there. If you've read in the book, you know, there's, there's a lot of grief that people have gone through as they've moved out of their houses. But also, there's this process of reimagining. I think that one thing we sometimes forget when we talk about climate change is that, you know, we, there are impacts that we have to deal with, but, but we also have the chance to ask ourselves what kind of place we want to be, what kind of community we want to create. And New Talk did a lot of that as they were thinking about how to rebuild, how to relocate. These are their houses on the other side of the river. These are really beautiful houses. They're up on a bluff. Um, people have asked me about these. They're, they are not, in fact, flood prone. Um, they're higher than maybe is really clear from the perspective of this. Um, they are on bedrock, so they're not going to thaw and fall apart and fall into the river. They are designed by an organization called the Cold Climate Housing Research Center. And they're, they're really warm and they're hyper insulated. Um, they're self contained, so they have their own water treatment system. Um, they uh, use a fraction of the amount of energy that a normal Alaskan home needs to heat itself. Here's um, one up close. You can see that's a picture of the window. You can see how thick the wall is. That's all insulation in there. Um, as I said, New Talk Alaska went through a process of reimagining itself and asking who they wanted to be. And they're continuing to ask that question. There's um, discussions about how to bring solar to the community because they'd like to stop depending on diesel, even though they're way out in this very remote area. Um, there's conversations about wind. There's ongoing conversations about how to make the community more and more sustainable. Um, and they also just got a new piece of funding from the Biden administration, which will hopefully enable them to move the, the second half of the community over to the other side pretty quickly. So they're really a success story, albeit a messy one, but definitely a success story. Um, and then the last community in the book is the one that I mentioned at the very beginning. Um, this is the community of Richmond, California. And I showed you a picture of the Chevron oil refinery at the beginning. Um, this picture on the left is a picture of the Chevron oil refinery on fire. It caught fire in 2012. And it was a huge turning point for the community. Um, it was a huge industrial accident. 15,000 people went to local hospitals and health clinics complaining of respiratory issues. People were really angry, as you might expect. Um, people felt like they had been building something in this community and um, the refinery was putting them in jeopardy. And, and this all started really with people like Doree Robinson and her neighbors trying to reimagine what kind of community they wanted to have. So Doree's project was to build urban farms all over the community um, and to get kids involved in learning green jobs, learning green skills. Um, learning how to do landscaping, learning watershed restoration. As a result of her work, um, things started to happen like the company Nutiva, which is an organic food distributor, came into town um, and set up, you know, set up the headquarters there. They had, um, you know, they had more and more young people involved in local politics. They had kind of a shift in the political climate in the city, and um, the city began to elect more and more people who were concerned about the refinery and concerned about the future of the place. In 2014, Doria and her staff decided to build this much bigger farm on the outside of town. And um, let's see, by the end of 2020, they were producing 60,000 pounds of produce a year and distributing it to hundreds of 
families around the region. And um, you know, as more and more of these kinds of efforts happened, people started to see opportunities in this community. Um, this is a solar farm that's right next to the refinery. It's the largest solar farm in the Bay Area. Um, and there's also a number of solar companies that have opened up around Richmond. And as a result of these kinds of efforts, the community has started to ask even more you know, direct and ambitious and sort of audacious questions about the refinery. Um, they're, they're asking them you know, also in, in conversation with the workers who are there. They're having, starting to have open conversations with the union about what kinds of jobs the refinery workers might want to have in the future. Um, a former union leader now works for the city mayor, and so you know, they're having this sort of open dialogue. Um, and uh, this is a, you know, a, a fairly, uh, let's say, confrontational campaign, but also a really interesting one that um, a local group started called about how Chevron has a toxic relationship with the city of Richmond. Um, and they use that as a metaphor to say it's time to break up with Chevron. But this isn't just a sort of you know, pie in the sky idea that an activist group came up with. Now there's a, a new mayor, there's a five to seven majority on the city council from a local party that favors really aggressive climate action. And they're actually saying, how can we research and plan and think about what it might mean for this refinery to close down? What it might mean for this community to become something other than an oil community? And we have to examine that question because if, if the world and if California is going to take its climate goals seriously, the refinery can't be there forever. Um, and this all fits in with a much larger conversation about communities and how they play a role in our climate future. So I've been uh, talking with people like Bill McKibben, people like uh, Rewiring America, since Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act in August, there's a much more earnest, very vigorous effort to talk to communities about what does it look like to make transitions beyond fossil fuels? What does it look like to you know, swap out our gas-powered appliances and heaters and put in renewables and electric? Um, how can communities do that in a way that's fair, in a way that's affordable? Um, and so Bill um, said this in an event that I did in January. He said that the transformation of American homes away from fossil fuels is going to have to be done on a community by community basis. And you need to have whole community buy-in so that we can make this happen quickly and cheaply. And that's the work of the years ahead. So what I'm saying is, and what the book is saying, is that there's a lot of power in what we can do at home to face the climate crisis. There's a lot of solutions that we can find at home. There's a lot of power in recognizing what we care about in our communities and from there thinking about what kinds of decisions we wanna make. What do we wanna protect? How do we think about what kind of future we want? And those kinds of solutions are actually way more transformative than I think we've given them credit for. Not everything that we do about climate change has to happen at the top down. A lot of it can happen where we live at home. And um, I'll give you just a little quote from the book. I put it up here, but I'll read it to you. I, this is something I often read to people as a sort of a sum up thing when it, someone asks me, what is the, 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 what is the takeaway message of the book? I've taken one main lesson from observing the struggles of Richmond and other communities like it. We think of power as belonging only to a select few, those who rule the world and those who own most of the wealth. But there is a kind of power that grows from the ground around you. Power can come from community. Power can come from home, from knowing that we belong to a place and a planet, and it is our collective job to grow something useful here and to create space for the generations that come after us. Enormous, radical solutions are necessary to remedy the climate crisis. Big policies, big ideas, big economic shifts. So far, the rulers and the billionaires haven't been leading us toward anything that will realistically keep us from catastrophe. So far, many of the most ambitious strides have come from the grassroots, from the marchers and protesters, the small town mayors, 
the artists and teachers and musicians, the firefighters and farmers and scientists, the people who have their hands in the dirt, the people who are able to reimagine how to live. Here, in the smallest of places, there are big transformations that can reverberate and ripple around the world, especially if we decided as a society to nourish such efforts, to lend our own energy to them, to dig in. So that's, that's my message. Um, and I'll happily take questions, and I would also love <laughs> issues that people are facing here and about things that people are taking on here as well. So, yeah. Well, first of all, on Lonely Island, we've um, read the book, we had a book club called Was Saving Us from Catherine Cable, and we formed a resilient Lonely Island group um, that has worked really closely with um, the Whatcom County Climate Advisory Committee, uh, Charles Bailey and uh, Dave Kirshner on the island. And, um, we've just been emanating information right now, We're trying to do some things. Whatcom County has three times the greenhouse gas emissions of any other area in the state of Washington. Wow. And the reason for that is because we have the Cherry Point refineries and we have the Anacortes refineries to the south of us and the winds go from the south to the north. Um, Ray Kamada of um, BP and the top process engineer out there is working very diligently on coming up with solutions, including a one mile uh, solar panel farm on the BP property. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you some ideas of what we're doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I was supposed to repeat <laughs> Some of this into the night when I'm not sure that I could sum all of that up. <laughs> Except to say that um, you all have been having a conversation based on saving us and yeah. um, that you've also been talking about the, the local refineries here mm -hmm. and what's going to happen with them. Do folks have questions or comments or <clears throat> thoughts? Yeah, Dr. Uh, are you seeing more tree planting efforts underway, both in communities to protect homes from high heat and you know, save energy and air conditioning, as well as just tree planting like the Long Island Area Trust was two years and running now, planted, oh, you know, a couple of acres, restored quarry, um, no small plants, <laughs> and uh, planted 3,800 trees this year. Um, are you seeing that kind of effort going on? Because that's something that anybody can can always squeeze a couple more trees in your yard. I know this is your house, you can be saying it. <laughs> the person in the picture. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure which person, but, but um, um, yes, um, a, a lot of, um, it's an eyelash in my hair. Hang on, just a second. <laughs> Technical difficulties. Um, yeah, a lot of cities especially um, are talking about uh, the, so the urban heat island effect, which I think you just... Oh, and I was supposed to repeat the question, so I'm sorry. The question was about whether um, a lot of communities are talking about tree planting as a strategy. Um, and yes, um, so a lot of cities, um, because of the concerns about the urban heat island effect, are taking much more seriously the urban tree canopy, especially because um, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, like, of what, what's true here on Pony Island in terms of percentage of the pavement versus I would imagine that you're you're doing pretty well with greenery. But when you get to a place like well probably even parts of Bellingham, certainly parts of Seattle, um, there are places where there's not a lot of tree canopy and there's a lot of concrete and of course all of that concrete reflects heat back at people. And unfortunately um, that tends to be correlated with also things like uh, lower income areas of cities, and it also tends to be correlated with all of the other measures that you might talk about with social vulnerability and um, you know, unfairness. Um, places that have fewer trees tend to more often be places lived in by communities of color. Um, but places like, I did a, a story for the New Yorker actually about Louisville, Kentucky, because they have one of the worst 
growing the island effects in the country. And a, there was a huge effort of people mobilized there. They did some mapping of where the trees were. They did some mapping of the predictions of heat there. And they've been doing a huge effort to try to plant trees and to try to look at where the trees are not and put them in. So yeah, it is a thing that cities are aware of. I think it's a thing that probably needs to happen more more dramatically like everything else, but, but yeah. Yeah. Your chapter on community really, um, as a, a born and raised city person, and spent you know, 20 years in Seattle before coming up here, the correlation between community and family and how that is so regenerative for every individual in that group because together we're bigger than we are individually. Mm -hmm. And a good example of that is the Heritage Trust that was mm -hmm. formed by Islanders and has been supported by Islanders and uh, has managed to protect, plant, and enrich so much of island property which never would have happened mm -hmm. if we had a, you know had tried to do things like that individually. Mm -hmm. And your your chapter on community just really ran it down in a way that made it so crystal clear how fortunate we are to have something like community and how different it is from living in Seattle. You know, you're surrounded by people and you all go out of your way not to look at each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a big city. It's a big city. Well, it's it's in city. city. Yeah, yeah, it's just the nature of the beast. But uh, yeah, the Heritage Trust is, is really a good example of what communities can do. Well, thank you for that. Um, and so, so the comment is that um, there's a lot one can do in community that one cannot do individually. And one wonderful example of that is the Heritage Trust here. Um, I guess I will say, in defense of cities and of Seattle, that, <laughs> that I actually do see um, quite a lot of, of community-level effort happening. Um, Seattle has a series of associations that are neighborhood-focused. So, for instance, there's one called Sustainable West Seattle. Um, there's an, there, there's analogous ones in all of the rest of the city, and I'm honestly not going to be able to name them all for you. Um, Sustainable West Seattle has done a lot of different initiatives around the, around the neighborhood. Um, from the sort of micro level initiatives, like there was, I'm not sure if it's still running since the pandemic, but there was a West Seattle tool library. I think it is still running. You can go and borrow tool, you know, like power tools. And I mean, you know, that might not seem like a climate solution, but in another way, I think it is in the sense that I mean, it's con directly confronting consumerism. And you know, we don't need to all buy our own stuff and the impact of everyone buying their own particular power washer or whatever mm -hmm. is, is not insignificant. And then I will also say that um, even a little effort like that and, and what you're describing as well, um, there's, a, there's big correlations between community resilience and our ability to re re recover from disasters yes. and also yes. prepare for and respond mm -hmm. to future impacts. Mm -hmm. Based just on how well we know our neighbors. So like um, the terrace was a really tight knit community and I think that had a lot to do with why they were able to recover from wildfire and you know that community didn't just disappear or ever be moved out. Um, people really got together and helped each other rebuild. And I, I think in the reporting of my book, I mean I, and just in my reporting in general, I mean you you can't yes. If you walk through downtown Seattle, people look away from each other. But um, I will also say that that um, I think there's there's this, uh, an impressive amount of community building in Seattle as well. You, you just have to find it in different places, and it's maybe not as uh, I don't know automatic as it might be in a place where you sort of have to know everyone because you're in a tiny tiny place where you bump into them in the grocery store all the time. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you for coming. Well, thank you. And for writing a great book. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, like, well, can I ask you all? So, can I ask you all what um, sort of what kinds of impacts are you feeling here on Lonely Island? I just did a workshop on Bainbridge, and people were talking about some of their. But yeah, yeah. You know, I think one of the big things that's going to impact here, and we saw this two years ago in November when we had a lot of washouts. Uh, one of the local roads washed out completely. But we had these huge floods. Mm -hmm. in Whatcom County, and it's still, uh, the county is still dealing with that. Mm -hmm. It was massive, and mm -hmm. I think though, more of those things might happen here, and sometimes I think about what's what happened in California over the last couple of months could just as easily, with wind shifts, have been, normally those sorts of pineapple expresses shift more and more. Mm -hmm. So that could have been us instead of California if the winds had just been a little different. But we're going to see more of that sort of precipitate, large precipitation events happen. And how it impacts this island is that we get more bluff erosion because the, the water just cannot, you know, sink all the way in. And some of the houses on both sides of the island have have a lot more of the cliff erosion going on. That happens naturally, but also with bigger rains events, it's going to happen more. And one of the roads, uh, West Shore Drive, you know, it keeps eroding. And in probably another, who knows, another decade or less, um, that road might not be passable. Uh, it, you know, we might have to move the road back in. Uh, things like that with big rain events, I think, are, can be significant in a place like this. Also, the big wind. Mm -hmm. You notice, look, I mean, I raise bees, and so we have, um, we I used to have, have less wind. We, we have much more wind on the west side than we used to. Um, this year we have a little bit less, but when I got to the last two years previous, I could move my bee hunts and more to more protected area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, we had um, flooding. Um, I've been here for 32 plus years, and mm -hmm. I have never seen uh, a river for our atmospheric river. What was that? A year and a half ago? Yeah, mm -hmm. November 21. There was actually a big river <laughs> that was coming from the area behind. My house and going between the barn and the outbuilding and coming down into the yard and under the, I mean, you know, everything was, I've never seen anything like that. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're thinking about, you know, how you can protect your home and yeah. how you can capture the water. I mean, this is, I, I live in a water recharge area, but I wasn't recharging <laughs> during that river. That's what it was. Yeah. It was all just. <laughs> If, if there's more to say, we can keep saying yeah. it or be enough. I mean, I, I, as I said, I, I, um, I was part of a workshop in Bainbridge Island where they were talking about very similar sorts of things. And I think, I don't know, I think, I think I've been thinking about this, but, and actually there was some talk about this, but there's probably a lot of opportunity for island communities in this region of the world collaborating and have conversations about some of these things, because I think they're, they're parallel. They were talking a lot about king tides as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, also being dependent on a ferry and you know with mm -hmm. sea level rise to the you know the terminal facilities and stuff like that on both sides have to, you have to kind of take that into consideration. We're due to have a new ferry come online mm -hmm. in I think 2026. 
So just more of a comment than a question. Now is that some people on the island, Elizabeth and Bird in particular, do do a lot with data. They collect data and <coughs> rainfall data and weather data, and that's really really valuable. Mm -hmm. Looking over the long term, so it's mm -hmm. like thirty or forty years of data, rain, mm -hmm. rainfall data, 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 and that really helps. And and I was just thinking about the road from the interstate that you probably came on down Slater. Mm -hmm. <coughs> that's slated for rebuilding. Mm -hmm. We were driving that yesterday, and my wife and I were talking about it, saying, I wonder if they're going to raise that high enough to anticipate for climate change 50 years from now. Yeah. And how do you project that when we're constantly ramping up, we're building on the data that we have, but it's changing under our feet? Yeah. You know? And how, how do you adjust for that? Are they just going to have to keep raising that road every two, three feet, every I, I don't know. How do you make those multi multi million dollar investments everywhere based on incomplete data? It's it's I mean that's like sort of the literally the millions of dollars question right, that, that a lot of cities are having to deal with and it, it it makes it really challenging. I think a lot of cities have chosen to focus on like kind of smaller scale solutions and green engineering and things like that rather than like massive infrastructure projects like you all probably heard about how Venice you know, has tried to put up these tide gates, but they've had a, a lot of mixed successes with them and issues, and, and then they also you know, cut the city off from, from the rest of the bay. Um, so I mean, a huge solution like that sounds good, but um, doesn't always provide what people need. But yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess this is part of what I was saying about how we have to be talking about adaptation and mitigation at the same time. Like, if we don't deal with the mitigation part of it, our communities won't be able to adapt very well because it just becomes more and more expensive and as, as this change happens more quickly. Maybe we have time for one more question or comment. Yeah. Or if we don't, and you don't already have <laughs> Madeline's wonderful book, um, we are going to be selling them, and I'm sure she would be happy to sign them. Um, so thank you very much for coming. And it's <laughs>